Hello, and thank you everyone for joining us for the for the DOE uh, Office of Indian Energy Program Review, our first ever virtual review. Next slide, please. We did do um, introductions um, on Monday. We did a program um, overview as well, and did each subsequent session. So I'm gonna sort of breeze through this part. Uh, the slides are available. The recordings from the other session are available if you want if you want more. Uh, this is Lizana Pierce. I'm the deployment supervisor for the Office of Indian Energy, executing the deployment program, which is comprised of financial assistance, technical assistance, and education and outreach. And I've had the uh, honor and privilege of working with Indian tribes in Alaska, many Alaska Native villages over the last 20 years. Next slide, please. Next, we have uh, Tommy Jones. Um, he's the newest member of our federal staff. Um, he started as an intern and um, was a contractor to the office. Next slide, please. Um, and he has now joined us as a federal employee. He will be breaking in um, to the presenters and go back one and giving them a five minute warning. So that's Tommy. Uh, next, we have Tweety Doe. Um, I met her originally when she worked with the Council of Energy Resource Tribes, if you all remember, a uh, certain um, the infamous David Lester. Um, she joined um, DOE under the Office of Energy Efficiency during the Recovery Act days with um, the Energy Efficiency and Conservation Block Program. Um, I met her when she was with CERT and, you know, uh, Tweety Doe, DOE, was destined to happen, so we finally brought her home to the Office of MD and Energy. Next slide, please. So just quickly, a sense of the office, we um, have nine federal employees. We have eight contractors. Um, and I was going through this and realized that's actually twice as many federal employees as we had last November at the program review. So uh, we do have a, a few new folks. Next slide, please. So this picture was taken um, at the last uh, program review in November. I just want to highlight some of the changes, uh, personnel changes since then. And you can read, you know, the names as I go through that. But since last November, uh, Gibby Kokanowski has taken the senior policy advisor position. He remains duty stationed in Alaska. Gibby's been joined by Alan Verbisky, a real new um, a federal employee as well. He's not shown. Alan is an engineer and has a wealth of knowledge and experience with all kinds of energy and energy systems um, and a great deal of experience working with Native Alaska villages. Since joining the office, he's basically returned home to Alaska. Uh, Brent Petrasic is not so shown previously with the, was with the DOE's Office of Environmental Management, has a history of working with tribes and joined as a senior advisor duty station in Washington, D.C. Uh, Director Frost, who's shown in the back row there, second from the right, has also been joined in D.C. by Quintella Wilson, our budget officer. Yay, great town budget officer. And uh, Paulette Toole, our new uh, management analyst. She's also not shown. And um, as I said, a very recent addition is actually uh, Dr. Tommy Jones, um, who's pictured on the far right of the picture. On the contractor side, Jessica Becker joined the deployment team in Colorado to act as a project monitor supporting um, some of the grant agreements you've, you've heard this week. Next slide, please. So before we jump into the project presentations, I wanted to go over some event details. Today's webinar is being recorded. It will be made available on DOE's Office of Indian Energy website in a couple weeks. Copies of the presentation slides will be posted um, to the website as well. I think Monday and Tuesday are posted and expect the rest of them to be posted by early next week. Everyone will also receive a post-event email with links to the page where these slides and the recordings will be located. Because we are recording this webinar, all phones have been muted. We'll answer your written questions at the end of the second, the, the final presentation of this session, pardon me. You can submit your question at any time by clicking on the question button located in the webinar control box on your screen and typing in your question. Uh, for presenters, uh, please ensure you're muted when not presented. Uh, be, a, be aware that because we're on a tight time frame, Tommy Jones will um, break in and give you a five minute uh, reminder um, to conclude your presentation. Hopefully that doesn't throw you off your stride. And then we will do questions at the end of the last presentation. 
And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tweedy to give you sort of a uh, overview of uh, the, why we do the program review and um, introduce our speakers. Tweedy. Thank you, Lizana. Um, welcome, everyone, to day four, session 11, the final session of our virtual program review. I hope we will be able to safely see you all in person next fall. Um, my first exposure to this annual uh, event was in 2005 as a presenter for CERT. Uh, I appreciated the sharing and the learning with others working in Indian country, and now I am so grateful for being able to work with our DOE team and um, with all of you, our grant recipients. Uh, I love the annual program review because we get to celebrate our mutual successes. Um, the annual program review is a forum to hear from our grant recipients report on their projects, um, which is also a requirement of accepting a grant from uh, our office. Presenters provide updates and share with us the lessons they've learned with, uh, with us and to maybe inspire new, new project ideas from attendees, uh, for attendees. In normal times, our program review is a wonderful occasion for dialogue and networking. In this virtual format that we have, uh, we invite you to listen and think about maybe one thing that stands out and ask questions of our presenters using the chat function that uh, Lizana just mentioned. So far in our 10 previous sessions, we have heard from 28 grant recipients on 35 projects. Uh, amazing. For this final session 11, we will hear from Spirit Lake Tribe, uh, Bad River Band of Lake Superior Tribe of Chippewa Indians, and uh, to round up, Northern Cheyenne Tribe. Uh, hopefully if we get Kyle online here, I think we're still chasing him down. And then following the talks, we will respond to your comments and questions. So please think of questions and type them in in the chat function. Okay, uh, let's get this started. First up is Jim Yockey, who will present on behalf of Ryan Brown for the Spirit Lake Tribe's 1.5 megawatt community wind energy project. Thank you, Jim, for stepping in. And you are on. Well, thanks, Tweety. Um, greetings, everybody. Lizana, Kevin, all the folks there at DOE, uh, as you know, this has probably been my, uh, I don't know, at least 15, 16 years of this. Uh, and happy to, to jump in here. Ryan uh, says hi to everybody. He, uh, he literally came down with probably COVID last night and is is struggling today and didn't think he could present. So I just wanted to, uh, he, he wanted to shout out to everybody. He was really looking forward to presenting and, and uh, he really enjoys uh, interacting one way or the other with uh, the DOE program review. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just a little outline of what we're gonna go through here today, uh, similar to what we've done in the past. Uh, this project has been going on for a while, uh, lots of delays for lots of reasons, but nevertheless uh, making progress and we're pretty still excited about getting uh, getting a turbine spinning by the end of this one. Uh, so uh, let's go to the next slide. So background on Spirit Lake. Spirit Lake uh, is uh, obviously federally recognized Treaty of 1867. Um, it's really divided up into um, four districts, and uh, the the one in which the headquarters is located is really in Fort Totten. But Crow Hill, Fort Totten, Mission, and Wood Lake districts are are the different districts, and there's a, a district representative. Uh, we did have a change over this last period of time for the chairman, um, uh, and uh, as you know, lots of interesting tribal politics as things go along, but um, that was part of the delay was there was a, um, a change of leadership midstream here on the last uh, the last round. Uh, so that's a typical context in which, you know, you guys are all familiar. Um, a lot of, lot of land, it's a land-based tribe, 245,000 acres, 383 square miles. Uh, most of it is, um, tribally owned uh, or allotted 
or, I mean, not most of it, less than, you know, less than 50% of it actually is, 62% is uh, fee land. So the Dawes Act really um, checkerboarded things there. Um, in terms of enrollment, 7,577 members of which uh, just shy of four grand uh, people live on uh, in within the reservation boundaries. A lot are in Minneapolis and in the surrounding area. Uh, here's the map. You can kind of get a feel for uh, where it's located. North Dakota, North North Dakota, not as far north as Turtle Mountain, but North North Dakota, um, and uh, really, uh, you know, fairly fairly brutal. But right on uh, what's called Devil's Lake, but Spirit Lake is is the proper name. Next slide, please. This just gives you another sense of of it, and it's really connected. Obviously, the Devil's Lake and uh, the size of Devil's Lake, which keeps growing, uh, is a is a main part of essentially the geography and the life ways of uh, of Spirit Lake. Next slide. So with respect to wind energy, Spirit Lake actually was one of the first tribes along with Turtle Mountain and um, Blackfeet, a couple other tribes that had gotten um, used wind turbines from uh, Palm Springs. And so they actually had put up a Micon 108 back in the day many, many years ago, and it lasted for 10 years and has since been decommissioned. But that um, that experience and the the thought of it has always been there. And, and the tribe has actually gone through a couple different iterations of looking at pretty large commercial scale wind. We are actually in the middle of a commercial scale wind development in addition to this single turbine project. Um, so wind is obviously on the tribe's mind a lot. It's very windy, and uh, we're we're hoping to really take advantage of it here uh, for lots of reasons that I'll go into. Next slide, please. Um, Ryan likes to just highlight some of the other items that the the tribe does. The tribe has been moving towards self governance in uh, for a lot of different components of both government function and uh, economic function and infrastructure. And so uh, that is, uh, you know, IHS and, and the Spirit Lake Health Center is a, is a big part of it. Um, next slide, a couple of the other pieces of, um, of, of what's going on. So the tribe has, did create really the first net zero school on tribal lands consists of solar, geothermal, heat pumps, you know, very um, heavy duty um, insulation and, and LED lights and sun pipes, basically um, all sorts of interesting components. And, and that has been a successful project that uh, the tribe is quite proud of. Next slide. I think this is a little bit more just the outside of the net zero school get a feel for um you know for it. other tribal uh entities so the one that's that he didn't mention actually super propane was one of the first tribal propane companies tribally owned propane companies he, he didn't list it here I, I think he just it's just an oversight um but that uh, got started in the early 2000s um, along with the uh, uh, Sandy Rock. Uh, Sandy Rock also did that. Um, and I was involved in, in helping that stuff get off the ground back in the day. Uh, Sioux Manufacturing is a fairly large uh, facility, 8A government contractor. Um, these are some of the products that uh, are, are involved. It's a, it's a large scale economic development opportunity and uh, um is um is a going concern which is awesome to see next slide other entities the housing corp um significant amount of work that goes into uh into that quite a bit of lahi funding goes into that which we'll talk about later 
um, community schools, uh, they, the college of which um, um, both the high school and the, and the college which Ryan attended and, and did some work. Ryan is actually the first engineer to graduate um, from North, uh, well, North. He, he was at NDU, but uh, he's the first engineer from the tribe to, to graduate. Um, so kind of uh, a great milestone. Next slide. Obviously, this Spirit Lake Casino and Resort, which has been completely shut down um, due to COVID, um, you can kind of see how it was built out and what what you know. There's a marina. There's the the, the casino itself, parking lot. Um, if you go to the next slide, you can see what happens when uh, that's climate change and uh, Devil's Lake has basically gotten huge and continues to grow and has taken over a big chunk of the land that was around the, the casino. So it's li literally like an island, you can drive off to, to an island. So it's kind of an interesting, interesting picture, I thought. Next slide. Okay, so getting at the project itself, we were really looking to do a net really a, a, a virtual net metering, aggregated net metering um, project. And we wanted to do that by essentially putting up a, a wind turbine. That wind turbine is going to generate credits based on a, a, a negotiated virtual net metering um, contract. And then from there, we would be displacing um, an aggregated quantity of residential rates through uh, a bill crediting type program, very similar to what we had done um, in um, uh, Seneca. Um, so that is the, that's the, the framework in which we wanted to do that. We're currently served there at, by Otter Tail, Northern Plains and NODAC. NODAC serves just some residential customers. It's actually fairly high cost, but the residential customers are kind of on the fringe of the, of where the majority of the population is. And so um, not a great place to, to try to displace. Northern Plains and Otter Tail are, are more centralized. So what we wanna to try to do is do virtual net metering, uh, especially within the Northern Plains uh, co-op. Uh, and again, we, we have this small scale type well, small scale meaning single turbine type project. It's a utility scale turbine, but the um, large scale, we're also looking at, at developing a pretty large scale wind turbine project uh, on land that's, uh, we have site control and, and uh, data. So uh, we've had anemometry up and around the area for years and years through uh, Department of Energy Mineral Development and a couple other grants. So we have very good uh, wind resource data on um, on and around the reservation. Um, part of what we wanted to do was, uh, and the next slide kind of shows it is is our model, and maybe um, maybe that's oh I guess we're still on energy. Okay, so this just kind of breaks down the energy from the different uh, entities. We have updated this for Otter Tail and Northern Plains NODAC. Uh, we have not updated. We were able to get all the, the data together before this. Um, and so we have a, a, a good idea of the actual kilowatt hours and, and costs. So this reflects uh, you know, 2019 data, which is is um, better than what we had had, obviously, in the last presentation. Next slide. So you can kind of see that Otter Tail is the largest uh, provider. Otter Tail also serves the, uh, the casino and hotel, and that's why it's the larger one. Um, Northern Plains is next, and then NODAC on the back end. But NODAC actually has the highest cost, and we would love to displace it. It just doesn't make sense based on uh, location of substations and, and, and things like that. Uh, you can kind of get a sense of the cost, $14 or 14 cents per kilowatt hour uh, on uh, NODAC down to eight cents a kilowatt hour for Otter Tail, uh, which is why the majority of the load is on Otter Tail. We would like to get to parity so that everybody on the reservation is paying the same amount. And that this project among some of the other projects are, that's the intention is to try to 
get everybody to be paying the same amount. And uh, that's what we're hoping to, uh, to accomplish. Next slide. So the strategic elements of this particular project is to get control of, of um, one of the substations and in particular, the, the Central Power Electric Co-op substation. So Basin Electric, which is the, uh, you know, the GNT or, you know, the, the generation transmission uh, company that supplies a lot of the co-ops in the Dakotas, uh, they're kind of structured interestingly. They have their power plants, and then the um, Central Electric is another co-op that actually owns all the distribution substations, and then the co-ops themselves only own the distribution, you know, the poles and the wires that come out of that substation. Um, so interestingly enough, we found out that Central Power power into uh, that particular substation is not supplied by Basin. Um, it's actually supplied by Ottertail. So that opens up uh, some opportunities for us to uh, interact. We were interacting with Ottertail in a pretty, uh, uh, I would say, cooperative manner. And um, this kind of opens up the possibility that we're going to be able to do that um, and, and do that in a way that is going to work for this overall project. But uh, the key, obviously, is getting some kind of control of this distribution sub so um or the power supply into it next slide please the overall model that we are developing here is we've got a number of projects that are going to provide cash flow into the tribal utility organization so as i mentioned before there's a substantial amount of lie heap that uh, the tribe receives about, you know, 300 grand that can go directly to the tribal utility organization. Um, they have a WAPA allocation. Again, the WAPA allocation was set up to provide hydropower to a utility company. So until you've got a tribal utility company, which you're all you're getting is a is a credit on your bill, and it's being distributed across a bunch of different uh, accounts. So we'd like to aggregate that so that it's an actual cash flow credit into the tribal utility organization and actually becomes essentially part of the port power purchase portfolio that the tribal utility would have. In addition to that portfolio, we're working on the distributed wind project, which is the single turbine 1.5 megawatt turbine. Pardon the and then you have five we're developing the project. Okay. So the um, the large wind project will also be the basically lease and development fees that we're looking to provide into the TUA, and then ultimately we expect that to to add essentially credits to tribal members to achieve rate parity. Next slide, please. So as you know, the location in, in North Dakota. Uh, best wind in the country, estimated wind speed at the site that we're looking at is 8.2 meters per second. Um, right now, there is a, there's a number of closures of coal plants uh, from Basin, um, and we think that's going to be part of the opportunity. As you, you may or may not know, on the wholesale market, wind, uh, wind has definitely depressed prices, uh, which is good. It's getting too cheap to meter. But um, now that some of these coal plants are, are retiring, there's going to need to be some more wind. And so we're thinking that's an opportunity for the large scale wind project. Capacity factor at this site is we expect it to be quite high and uh, you know just a crazy screaming wind resource. Next slide. Uh, the initial project pro forma, if we can displace that 12 cent power, it's actually 11 cents. We probably should adjust this a bit, but if we can displace that, we think it's a, a pretty decent pro forma, um, and that's even with debt. So essentially, that's what we're we're looking at. Um, so this this pro forma uh, is is kind of what represents what we we put together at the beginning of this project. Next slide. So the total project cost of this single turbine project is 4.7 million. We've got a million dollar grant. Our match is basically um, at least 
I know there's cost share things and we did put in an application for a change in cost share. So we'll see how that all goes. Um, we do have some good potential uh, cost share partners that we're dealing with. Um, and the tribe has been putting away money as well. So we think that um, we're gonna be able to get there for that total project cost. Next slide. So this kind of gives a layout of the progress that we've made. Um, we're beginning the interconnection work. We've got an application uh, in front of Otter Tail. Uh, we're having discussions on uh, that, the idea of this aggregated net metering contract. Um, we've got leverage because uh, they obviously are supplying the casino and the casino uh, can choose who provides that power. Um, so lots of different balls in the air right now. Um, that's Ryan there, but that's basically, you know, we, we did get through quite a bit of uh, the environmental, uh, that assessment was completed in July. Um, interconnection is going on. We're working on right of way issues with that substation. Uh, we did sign a new WAPA contract, but we're open. We, we have it open so that we can, um, it can become power supply. Um, the rest of this stuff, uh, you kind of get a sense of it. We've, we've identified some of the cost share opportunities and um, we're keeping council informed. Next slide. Participants, uh, Ryan, obviously is the economic development planner. Uh, my firm, Baker Tilly, uh, we have been involved. I've been involved with Spirit Lake for many, many years. Um, West Engineering out of Madison is, a, is a, an engineering firm, Small Wind, um, and obviously we, we've still got a cost share partner that we plan to bring in, but not sure it's going to be necessary. And, and obviously we thank the Department of Energy, Office of Indian Energy. So that's all I've got. If there are any questions or whatever, um, this kind of shows the, kind of our next steps and what we're going to be doing. Uh, we have uh, that TUA, we're establishing it as an actual chartered entity. Um, we are uh, obviously providing updates. We have to do more community engagement, but that's pretty difficult to do COVID wise. So we're planning on moving that. We're continuing the legal regulatory review and um, are really working on the interconnection because that is the key to this whole thing is getting a, a good interconnection application and a contract with Ottertail. So I think that's it. If you have any questions, um, you can sign them. I'm happy to, to answer them. Thank you so much, Jim, for stepping in. You did a great job um, for Ryan. And we do send healing thoughts to, to Ryan for his recovery. Uh, please type in your questions for Jim in the chat function, and we will get to them at the, um, uh, at the end of the last presentation. All right, next we have Daniel Wiggins, Jr., who will tell us the story of the Ishkunig Nawadid solar project of Chippewa Indians. Um, Dan, how badly did I pronounce that? You're actually pretty close. I, I, I'm honestly closer than some tribal members that have attempted the name. So um, we pick good ones. <laughs> um, the, the, the language is a rather um, complex language, so um, no offense there. Um, but again, yes, my name is uh, Daniel Wiggins. I'm the project lead um, for the Bad River Band of Lake Superior Tribe of Chippewa Indians, uh, Ishkunige and Namadede Solar Project. Um, glad that you guys could have me present this information. We're excited to give you guys updates uh, kind of through this COVID experience we're all dealing with. Um, Bad River Band of Lake Superior Tribe is located uh, in northern Wisconsin, um, roughly on a 125,000 acre reservation. Um, right on the southern shores of Lake Superior, so very beautiful, um, and has over 7,000 members. The majority live in off the reservation, and about 2,000 live on and near the reservation. Go ahead, slide. Um, kind of an overview of what we're going to cover today um, within this 20 minutes, hopefully, um, is phase one um, and kind of the objectives and project details. Um, we'll go into kind of the next steps as well long-term planning and then also phase two you know what the tribe is looking at next um for the doe application but just in general 
Um, so, and then answer any questions to do things. Thank you. Um, phase one um, is just a, just a cover. So you can see that there is some solar panels being put up um, through this year. Um, and it is kind of, we kind of been moving along um, fairly well. Um, the objectives of Ishkun again now at a day, um, to, to remind everybody, if you weren't here last year, um, very clear translation is it catches fire. Um, one of the things we laughed about last year is it's a literal translation, which means it really does catch fire and not necessarily like a baseball net, which I initially believed. So um, we all learn through these experiences. I'm learning the language and everybody, I guess, is learning the language. Um, but when we submitted, it was roughly a $2 million project um, with a 50% USD comp contribution of a million dollars. Um, through the RFP process, it did jump to about $2.2 million, um, but the partners are willing to kind of cover those extra costs, fortunately. Um, one of the one of the biggest um, things to kind of develop this project or push the project was the 2016 flooding that the tribe experienced along with the northern part of the state of Wisconsin, um, highlighted crucial facilities such as a health and wellness center and other infrastructure that was affected by outages. Uh, the tribe is installing over 500 kWs of solar with over 100 kWh of battery storage at three facilities. Um, Chief Blackbird Administration Building, kind of the primary building for government functions, wastewater treatment plant, and then the Health and Wellness Center, all located in the Odeana community. And then the, H and the health clinics and the wastewater treatments plants are expected to um, offset the entire loads and provide a level of resiliency that can go possibly weeks, if not a month. Go ahead, slide. Kind of the details of the system. <clears throat> um, the Chief Blackbird Administration Building is a rather small system, so 24 kW. Um, kind of sized it with the generator we had on site, so it doesn't necessarily offset the entire um, load of the building. Um, but does offset a little bit and provide a level of um, extra level of resiliency. Um, the clinic and the wastewater treatment plants are probably the coolest of our systems um, being installed to date. Um, they both have battery backup. They're both able to kind of set offset the entire loads at the clinic, and then you know again provide a level of resiliency that can last up to weeks. You know if outages do occur. Um, another unique um, thing about the system is all systems operate on a DC bus system. So everything PVs and batteries is connected on the DC side. And then there is a cloud monitoring system, which provides a kind of cool feature. Go ahead, slide. This just gives you a overview of the Odana community, um, kind of where the locations of the buildings are. Um, so relatively close, I'd say that's all within probably half a mile of each other. Go ahead, slide. Planning and development. Um, developing this project, we used both strategic energy planning done in 2012 and 2017. Um, we also used a newly adopted 2018 emergency preparedness plan, um, which helped identify the critical infrastructure that we used and from the 2016 flood. Um, several buildings and scenarios were identified for the possible solid projects, and uh, we used the documents to kind of clearly identify the critical infrastructure. Go ahead, slide. Um, the execution of the project, um, you know, one of the things we were able to, to get done um, through kind of the COVID experience um, was the request for proposals, um, review of proposals. I'd say we had probably a very in-depth review of all the proposals and, and we're really able to kind of hammer through all the details and stuff that the contractors provided and provided the tribe with a fairly good um, recommendation on on who they should award. Um, we concluded that on May of 2020, and we awarded Faith Technologies to projects to, to install and um, invest into the third party. So um, one of the neat things we wrote at RFP was kind of a combination of going after both uh, the installer and the investment side of the project. So it, it ended up working out fairly well. Um, we are also able to um, execute some of the contracts and documents. Oh, I apologize, I'm not ready. <laughs> That's fine. Um, so lease in energy service agreement, several attachments. We started that June 2020 and executed those October of 2020. Um, the neat thing is we did begin construction October of 2020 and are kind of 
still going through construction currently. Right. Um, this is some pictures of the Chief Clerk Administration Building. Um, so we did go with a roof mount system. There's a nice metal roof. We got some gray brackets. Um, good wonders for the for the metal roof uh, infrastructure. Go ahead. Um, this is just some pictures of the wastewater treatment plant. Um, so you, on the left, you can see the field um, kind of before we started um, installing the posts, um, the solar panels. Um, there's a little bit of snow. So just showing what type of weather we're dealing with up here. It does get cold and snowy in October. Go ahead, slide. Um, this is the health and wellness center. We did have some drone footage um, kind of from just the overall projects in the area. Um, those trees were recently cut down, not by me and not for the solar project. Um, the clinic is working on expansions. Um, so we, we are closely working with the clinic and identifying any types of uh, adjustments or anything we have to do on our side for the system. Um, but as you can see, the back part is cleared and you can see where we use that field. Oh, go ahead, slide, that's fine. Um, this, this is a, maybe a little bit of a closer up, it really doesn't help, but and it shows some of the installations, the rack and the solar panels. So one of the guys working very hard on the bottom corner there. Go ahead. And there's our beautiful solar panels. Um, one of the highlights of the communities. This is exciting. Um, so some of the challenges, I, I think everybody can relate to COVID-19. I, I think when it hit is when we first started implementing the RFP process. Um, and I, I think it just provided another layer of challenges at first. Um, the tribe issued its declaration of um, public health emergency with uh, COVID-19 in March 2020. Um, so it started at safe at home orders in, in June. Um, so working from home and stuff of that sort. Um, made meetings difficult at first. So decision making by leadership, um, utility task force meetings, just overall team meetings in general were a little difficult. Um, to get off at first. However, um, virtual meetings have created a great level of communication that I think tribes and um, just overall staff are recognizing. Um, construction, uh, limited building access and extra precautions, uh, contractors coming from out of town, obviously. And then we required all contractors to have strict COVID-19 policies was one of the ways we kind of handled, handled that challenge. <clears throat> Um, this one is one I just kind of included as a project manager. You know, part of our job is to communicate with the with the community and just um, leadership in general. Um, is community accepted acceptance? I think replacing land with any type of inf infrastructure um, is not always going to be accepted by elders and environmentalists. Um, one of the elders I just put a quote in there. I don't know how I feel about it until I see the panels. The trees were nice. So just, just some points of views from the community still. And then there is a level of sovereignty given up when involved in partners and investors. Anytime this is said, um, not gonna be accepted by many tribal members. And just emphasizes the need for clarity and transparency, um, community meetings, presentations, um, stuff of that sort. <clears throat> Hold on one second. Um, accomplishments um, through, through COVID-19, I think if any tribe accomplished, you know, any project accomplishments, it, it, it's a highlight. So um, we were able to complete the RFP process. Again, I think we were able to do an in-depth review for the tribe and really provided a, a clear recommendation um, with clear positives and challenges for, for each contractor. Um, we executed construction and contracts. Um, and then one of the things I'm going to hopefully have time to um, provide present on is we developed a long-term strategy um, once Ishkun and that now what it is has been commissioned. Um, so we're working, um, yeah, kind of continuing, uh, we're still working with Faith Technologies to develop a tribal workforce. Um, so workers knowing how to install and handle panels. Uh, we had tribal workers during the construction of the rack and the PPs. Um, we're also working with the education department to support training uh, module with the 18 to 24 year old program. And then AMCO, the, the rack and installers, has offered complete training for the tribe with rack and PV. So I uh, appreciate their, their offer and we're definitely gonna take advantage of it. Um, facility managers will also be identified um, 
for technicians um, to work with faith technology staff or ISHINs as they're called by faith um, in order to develop skills to fully operate the microgrids. Um, there is a transfer of ownership and kind of um, operations after a, a certain period of you know the financing strategy. So once that transfer happens, the tribe does um, plan on taking over the operations as well. Um, kind of next steps, um, as you guys all seen as the panels, um, there still is batteries and interior electrical um, interconnection and commissioning is scheduled for March. And then uh, we're also executing a long-term phased energy plan for this project. Um, so phase two application is intended to be submitted in February. And then we're also identifying other funding strategies as well for other projects. Um, going over the partners, <clears throat> again, this is myself, uh, but obviously with all partners, this isn't gonna be easy task to complete. So um, within the tribe, um, so many programs and departments contribute to the plan and the development um, of these projects. Um, but I wanted to kind of highlight Check Bay Renewables, Bill Bailey, um, kind of the visionary of, of our solar project and this project in general. So he's the one who really kind of came in and helped to try really kick off uh, kind of the planning and strategies at first. Um, Madison Solar was a kind of really who led our RFP process um, did an awesome job, guided the tribe and the team, making sure that we highlighted all of the challenges and made the proper recommendations to the tribe. Um, MuGrid Analytics is the team that really put me and Bill's vision on paper. Um, so we can, me and Bill can create many visions, uh, but you really need someone like MuGrid um, to provide the economics, the design, and um, the ability to show this on, on a piece of paper, really. And then Faith Technologies, uh, kind of the new partner to the team, um, the installers and the finance and people. So um, without this team, um, this project would not, not be happening. So thank, thank you, team. Um, Long-term planning, uh, we conducted this in November. So we were awarded in um, October of 2019. Um, and we conducted a long-term planning strategy just based on, on the project itself. So trying not to just stop at phase one. Um, concentrated on a strategic phase approach, incorporating the Ishko Nawa Today Solar Project. And then we had a two-day collaborative meeting with department heads, leadership, and community representatives. Um, there is links to the poster and report that I have put on for the presentation. So um, when this is circulated, uh, feel free to, to look at the reports and posters. Go ahead. Next slide. <clears throat> Um, this is the poster. So the report is a longer version of the poster, uh, but this poster just highlights kind of the phase approach that we have for the, the Ishkone Nawakane project and highlights kind of what phase two and phase three would look until really the tribe is going to develop their, their tribal utility authority and public works. Um, phase two, as I told you before, we pick great names that are very challenging um to spell and to say so um just another one <laughs> um so i'm gonna do my attempt Giwiji waganinan itagan microgrid project um and what this means is community garden or three sisters garden kind of a prophecy for the ojibwe chippewa people and this was the original project title for the clinic health and wellness center as it's called and the uh, head start in elderly buildings when the clinic was originally built so there was a vision for when these buildings were first off and now these buildings are all there. So we do have a new Head Start that was just built, kind of making that vision um, a reality. And then we figured we'd kind of run with the name and you know use it and uh, apply these new buildings to the Health and Wellness Center's microgrid. Um, we are uh, anticipating on applying for USDA funds for some of using the same finance and strategy. Uh, the team is also working with uh, Bad River Housing Authority on phase three. So looking at elderly apartments and, uh, and other infrastructure along with a one megawatt solar garden specifically for residential benefits. Uh, some of the challenges- Pardon the interruption, that you have five minutes remaining. Thank you. Um, challenges are land availability and uh, kind of utility capability. Not kind of, but really utility capability. So thank you, um, next slide. Um, miigwech, thank you. Um, that, that is really what all I have today. Um, and yeah, any questions just go through the chat box, I think it's
uh, it's going to get in a worry day. <laughs> sure, that, that, is <laughs> that is I have, a, I have time to practice, but practice the, the next name that, that you've come up with. Thank you so much, uh, Daniel. It's so exciting to see the amazing progress that you've made on your project within, you know, the context of COVID and the difficult times that we are all living in. Thank you. Yeah, and, um, you know, I one of the, you... the go ahead. I, I just wanted to say one of oh, the go, people go ahead, I found yeah, I, I, th I think I, I gave a shout out to all the partners in Suffolk. I didn't really give you and, and Jen a thank you because I think through COVID, I think how DOE and how the, you guys were able to respond to a lot of Bad River's needs, um, you guys responded quickly and it, it really made the process fluent from a DOE and relationship perspective. So I appreciated the work that you guys provided as well. Thank you for those kind words. And it's recorded for posterity. <laughs> but uh, thank, thank you. I think I said that was wrong, but I thank appreciate you. it. All right, I want to do a quick sound check. Kyle, can you um, can you hear us? Can you uh, are you able to talk for us to hear you? Kyle, in Monica or um, or James. Are you able to unmute Kyle for us? We can play around with it, but maybe we should jump to question um, uh, while we okay. while we do that, just because we aren't quite okay. sure okay. how long that that'll take. But uh, we'll try to get Kyle on. Okay. And he, he's okay. logged in, but we got to make sure that audio works. All right. Um, so. Hey, let's, let me, um, I'll ahead. just introduce uh, James really quickly in case, in case you don't know James. He is um, a project monitor on some of your our projects and he's also uh, responsible and in, instrumental in bringing our monthly webinars and he's going to be moderating some of the questions that will come in and so we'll jump around maybe a little bit here, catch some questions until we can get uh, Kyle um, heard. All right. Sorry, James. Handing the mic back over to you. Thanks, Judy. I think we have Kyle now. Yes, we can hear you, Kyle. Oh, Kyle. Sorry great. about that. You want... that's, yeah, I've been yeah, here the whole time, that's... but the technology is uh, challenging. Yeah. So. Well, let me introduce Kyle Alderman very quickly here. Um, and uh, Kyle's going to be talking about the White River Community Solar on the Northern Cheyenne Reservation. Thanks for, for being with us, Kyle. I'm, I'm glad we over, overcame the technology challenges. Yeah, You're on. Thanks. Um, so yeah, uh, my name's Kyle Alderman. I'm the Renewable Energy Manager for the Northern Cheyenne Tribe. I graduated in 2019 with my degree in electrical engineering, and I was a UDAW scholar. Um, next slide, please. Northern Cheyenne Tribe consists of Tsitsa and Tsitsa people. There is over 11,000 enrolled members and over 5,000 reside within the reservation five districts. Our land base totals 444,000 acres with 99% owned by the tribe itself or individual tribal members. The Northern Cheyenne people value our connection with the creator and all life. Though many suffer from extreme levels of poverty, our people have continuously refused to sell our resources that deform and poison Mother Earth. Next slide. So project overview. Uh, last year when I was presenting on this, uh, it was just, uh, you know, 2.5 megawatts behind the meter. I mean, uh, a solar array, a utility scale, two different fields of those, and then three 100 kilowatt behind the meter uh, projects at three tribal buildings, the uh, Busby Tribal School, the Northern Cheyenne Head Start, and the Busby Water Pump House. And after looking at uh, the offtake rate or uh, the power purchase that was being offered at $26.5 a megawatt hour, uh, and then looking at what tribal members pay equivalent would be $110 a megawatt hour. So trying to, you know, utilize the revenues from this project to lower 
uh, electric bills for tribal members. Going that way didn't seem the most advantageous. Um, so we're looking at adding uh, 15 or more residential systems um, behind the meter. And uh, that'll definitely increase the revenues of the project and the benefits of the community. Um, next slide, please. So progress to date, uh, as I said, the, the change of adding those uh, 15 residential projects behind the meter uh, is, is a change that takes some work. Um, and uh, at the same time, uh, we're kind of re-looking at those uh, uh, larger arrays. So today, uh, the SOPO and budget revision that needs to take place is uh, near being finalized. We plan to add 15 plus brown mount residential projects behind the meter. Uh, this will also reduce the land area footprint of the total project. Um, another big uh, addition, which it was listed as a milestone, but there was no actual way of building tribal capacity. So we're adding uh, monies to facilitate a training uh, element to the project. Um, and since uh, I presented last year, uh, we've brought on a couple more team members, uh, the Covenant Solar Initiative and Protogen, uh, which has been uh, very, very valuable. Um, and Killa Newton, uh, we've continued to work with them and they got some some uh, good good work and, and good people to work with. Um, to offset any potential, potential additional costs uh, added to the project caused by the redesign, we're utilizing an EMDP grant. And uh, this doesn't count towards cost share, but it is an amazing opportunity to uh, really design this project in the way that uh, uh, it is aligns more with the goals of the tribe. Next slide, please. So specifically on the 2.5 megawatt portion of the project, or we'll, we'll see how big that is. Uh, this recently got word back from Trico, uh, the rural co-op um, this week. Uh, that looks like even that's a little bit too big for their system. But we're we're trying to shrink the footprint down into a nine acre layout, um, and uh, you know we still have that offer from Basin at twenty six and a half dollars a megawatt hour. But uh, recently in Montana, there was a Supreme Court uh, decision on these power purchases uh, prices that these companies were often offering. So I'm having the consultants look into that to see if. Uh, that might benefit us. Um, and then we got this partnership with Covenant Solar to identify tax credit investors and discounted equipment purchases. Uh, they, they found some uh, a really good deal on solar panels and we're doing the analysis to make sure uh, it's, it's beneficial. Um, the three 100 kilowatt behind the new projects, um, you know, we're making sure they're sized below the 100 kilowatts to fall within uh, the rural co-ops small generation bracket. Um, and uh, we're, we're seeing how much um, the tribe can uh, put towards these projects, though in, in these times it's, it's definitely challenging to um, think ahead too far. Um, in the 10 kilowatt residential systems, uh, we'll utilize Trico's residential net metering policy. We've uh, created a program to identify and enroll participants. And, you know, anybody who enrolls uh, will be on the list, but uh, priorities will be given to elders who are in good standing uh, or have a good payment history with that co-op. So, special considerations will be taken into account. 
Um, and we're working on the SPE formation, potentially indigenous power and light uh, to, project, to manage this system ownership. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, so the, the new proposed layout, uh, we're having them look at doing the solar array in the shape of the morning star, uh, which for, for me is uh, pretty empowering. And uh, you know it feels really good to to see uh, our our tribe symbol um, in such a big footprint and visible uh, and uh, hopefully hopefully the Busby residents appreciate it and that we can actually uh, make this happen. It might be uh, two smaller arrays in the shape of a morning star, but um we're we're getting those details worked out. Uh, next slide, please. So on the three 100 kilowatt behind the meter portion of this project, um, on the left is the Northern Cheyenne Tribal School. Uh, in the middle is the water pump house, and on the right is the uh, Tribal Head Start. And recently there was a, a a boys and girls club building put in in Busby and uh, leadership would like us to try to incorporate that into this project as well. Um, next slide please. And uh, so for the behind the meter portion uh, the 10 kilowatt residential layouts um, you know there's a few a few ways that we might go about this, this was the initial concept of, uh, you know, kind of, we're, we're limited to 10 kilowatt systems per house, but there's a lot of land there or a lot of areas that we could potentially put a hundred kilowatt uh, worth of, of solar panels. And then just in the electrical uh, uh, design, separate them into 10 separate systems. Um, and so that that's one of the ideas that we're looking at. Um, but also kind of depending on uh, the participants and, and where they fall, uh, DOE has expressed, um, you know, uh, their, their willingness to work with us to, to um, make this project happen. So we'll, we're getting closer. Um, so the, one of the big things, I mean, this entire project is pretty exciting, but um, one of the, the other awesome elements is the training program that we're trying to incorporate into this. And it will be performed in conjunction with our tribal college, Chief Dalnife College, and we'll be tar targeting tribal members with job skills and construction experience. So that's not a prerequisite. And there will be a hands-on focus on the ground mount equipment and methods that will be used on the White River project. And safety is a, a huge element that will be incorporated throughout it. Um, and the participants completing this training will be offered internships or full-time jobs in the construction of residential and commercial projects funded by the grant. So uh, you, uh, I'll come back to this, um, why, why it fits into the bigger picture. But the project participants to, to make this happen, uh, it's pretty cool to, to get so many uh, different programs or, or people involved in a common initiative or a common goal. And we got the tribal president on board, tribal council, sustainable energy committee, uh, renewable energy manager, Northern Shan, tribal attorneys, uh, Killa Newton, Covenant Solar Initiative, Protogen, Eco Cheyenne, and Chief Bell Knife College. Uh, Eco Cheyenne is a, a local Cheyenne company that promotes renewable energy uh, and uh, you know environmental health and uh, has volunteered their time to, to help and uh, get people on signed up and um, move this forward. Next slide please. So the project objectives um, you know there's there's many but some of the big ones are lower the cost of electricity for as many tribal members as possible, 
And that's what, you know, really looking at that as a goal, uh, it really encourages a redesign to, to bring that benefit directly to more tribal members. Um, and then training and jobs for tribal employees. Um, you know, it's, it's great to have, uh, you know, classes and opportunities, but when you couple that with a, a job opportunity and real world experience, um, that, that is a, a great way to start building capacity. Um, and to another objective to create revenue stream and, uh, learn and maneuver federal, state, and tribal energy regulations and also develop capacity to plan, develop, and manage renewable energy assets. And so we're, this, is, this is definitely a great way to learn um, and, and the assistance with the, the DOE um, providing this opportunity is, is great and I, I, it's much appreciated. Next slide. So in 2005, uh, the tribe really started kicking off the, the renewable energy endeavors, um, starting with Chief Dullknife College Solar Demonstration Project. 2007, we had a wind feasibility study. 2009, a 50 kilowatt roof mounted solar array. 2016, Tribal Council passed Sustainable Energy Initiative. 2017, uh, the Covenant Solar Initiative, uh, the team that they worked with, uh, nonprofit, Give Power, I believe it was, provided the 96 kilowatt roof mounted solar array for the Little Wolf Capitol building. And I've, we've looked at the, the numbers off of that and that reduced the tribes, um, or, or that provides over half of the tribal buildings uh, energy usage. Um, and then in 2019, the tribe hired uh, a renewable energy manager. In 2020, uh, we completed a, a 256 page community consultation and scoping report, solar, wind, and hydro, uh, with over 200 houses uh, surveyed. There was 98% in favor of renewable energy. Um, and uh, so, on. Where, where do we go from here? This is just the beginning. Um, you know, wind and solar training uh, is, is definitely a big part of it. Um, weatherization, you know, that should probably go, go first, um, because we need to, uh, uh, my screen just went flat. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the weatherization is, is super important because if, if we can focus on that, uh, that would reduce the size of the systems that we need to build or pay for, um, up to you know a 30% reduction in the size of a system, is is pretty good saving. Um, and the community residents. Five minutes remaining. Okay. Um, community residential and utility scale projects uh, will will definitely be in the future, along with tribal utility formation, and uh, you know as as this goes on, the microgrid and energy storage are pretty much um, inseparable from those. Uh, and all this leads to energy independence. Um, so thank you for your time and uh, uh, this opportunity. Yeah. Thank you, Kyle, for overcoming the, the technology challenges and um, and it sounds like you're making great progress, and uh, we look forward to, uh, with you on you know, working with you to um, better design your project to enable the tribes to realize their, their energy vision. Um, and that makes 31 grant recipients that we have heard from on 38 projects. I want to thank you, Kyle, Daniel, and Jim for stepping in. And I'm going to hand the mic over to James Jensen. We'll moderate the questions. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Tweety. And looks like we're right on schedule again. So good job, everyone. <laughs> um, first question here for 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 Jim. Um, could you describe a little bit more detail on the WAPA credit allocations and and um, the Spirit Lake Travel Utility Authority 
maybe just elaborate on those topics a little bit more. Yeah, sure. Um, so Western Area Power Administration runs a bunch of hydro plants um, and Missouri River Basin was, was one of the areas that, um, so a lot of tribes lost land, um, flooded land as a result of those projects. So about 20 years ago, they had actually realized that tribes had never gotten any of the benefit. And I mean, most of the most of the allocations had all gone to rural co-ops and or uh, essentially for irrigation of, of farmers. Uh, and, and there was a lot of flooded lands. So um, tribes pushed pretty hard and even and got the Western Area Power Administration to offer allocations, meaning a, a, a portion of the total output of WAPA would go towards the um, you know two tribes, and of course it's it's supposed to be power that's going to the tribes, but instead of power, they uh, they use the existing and incumbent utility providers to provide credits um, rather than actual power because tribes didn't have a lot of tribes don't have utilities. So, uh, you know, I've been involved in trying to help tribes develop utilities and, and the, the idea is that you would use the power as part of your overall portfolio as a way to reduce your costs as opposed to uh, a bill crediting. Now, the bill credit is kind of a, it's a, it's an interesting formula. Basically, it, it just, it looks at the wholesale power from the, from the wholesale provider and essentially credits the difference between WAPA power and that wholesale provider. But uh, it misses a number of things. And so getting the power from WAPA is ultimately more valuable than getting some kind of a bill credit through your existing tribal or your existing uh, utility company. Um, so that's really the that's the that's the process. It's it, you know we went through one iteration 20 years ago, and those contracts are are now up, and so a lot of uh, so I'm talking about the Missouri River Basin tribes. I'm not sure exactly how that uh, it's kind of similar in, in many of the other locations in Wapa, but those uh, other contracts are all now being renegotiated. Hopefully that helps. Help me, it's great. <laughs> um. A uh, question here for, for Daniel and the Red River Solar Projects. Uh, I'm not attempting the name. Apologize for that. Uh, uh, after Tweedy's good performance, um, it sounds like next steps for you are to, uh, uh, you know, pursue microgrid and, and eventually tribal utility development. Um, do you have timing for, for for those efforts? Do I have timing? Yeah, like do you have a timeline or expectation for how, uh, you know, when you will begin those, those efforts in earnest? Um, yeah, um, so we're, we're planning on implementing phase two. Obviously, um, the, the funding strategy for the Bad River Tribe does, does require a lot of grant financing, we'll say. Um, if not, we, we have to look for alternative um, financing. So we, the good thing is we do have partners and with the, the first phase, so Ishkana and Awadade did bring in partners. Um, one of the things I think is that, that you realize is when once you bring the partners in that there are financing um, opportunities, both with partners and outside lending um, agencies, including the US DOE. So, um, you know, we, we hope for grants um, to fall into place um, this coming year for phase two. So commissioning for phase one is scheduled for March. Um, I don't think there's an intended award date for, for DOE's um, um, applications right now. So um, really it's just a, just a waiting thing. And then obviously if things don't work out, then that's when we're gonna start looking at probably you know energy loans and stuff of that sort for phase two. Um, as far as the tribal utility authority, um, you know that, that works a little bit more complex. Um, so we are building microgrids right now. Um, I, I think the moment you build a microgrid, you have an opportunity um, to, to, to develop and dive right into a tribal utility authority. But I think that the, the complexity and, you know, kind of the goals of the tribe have to come into play on 
um, when that's going to be implemented. So uh, as far as a timeline for that specific activity, I would say that's probably a little five years down the road. I think that okay. was your question too. I apologize if I missed the total point. <laughs> no, I think that was it. Thank you. Um, a, a question here for Kyle, and, and Kyle, thanks for working with us through the, those, those challenges with the audio. And actually, are you still on, Kyle? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, uh, the, the morning star uh, shape for the solar array, do, uh, are there any challenges in, in designing a solar array in that in that shape as far as uh, you know efficiencies or or, or cost to build have, have, has that been discussed or um so so that's the space we're in now um I'm having Kevin Newton do the analysis on on that and um you know the just the uh, you know the spacing um and you know the, uh, the there is another possible change that we're looking at in in switching from fixed rack fixed rack to, or from tracking one axis trackers to fixed rack systems um and when you when you use uh is it the fixed Fixed rat systems, um, you can put them in closer together. Um, so they're they're going to do all those different analysis and uh, hopefully get back to us here in the next week or two. Great, thanks, Kyle. Um, that's our our last question. I think we our audience has is ready for us to wrap it up after a long week. But uh, I'll pass it back over to Lozana. Thank you, James, um, so much. And thank you to uh, not only the presenters for this session, but throughout the entire week. I forget, Tweedy's counting, but there's there's a bunch. <laughs> anyway, um, thank you all for joining us um, at our first virtual uh, program review. Again, um, we will post the slides here in the next couple of days, and the audio recordings for all of the presentations will be available in a couple of weeks. Um, before we uh, close, I just, um, again, I think this is like my 18th uh, program review and, and it's, it's amazing the, the sort of evolution that's happened in the last couple of decades um, and it's so inspiring. And in 2010, um, with the Office of Indian Energy, we sort of began focusing on hardware in the ground. And for me, that, that was so exciting because it actually, rather than studies and feasibility studies and that kind of thing, we're actually, you know, helping the tribes put hardware in the ground, which makes, you know, a difference to, to people's lives um, and community members. And, and so, I don't know, I feel blessed uh, to have had the opportunity to work for the last uh, 20 years doing this and I hope I'll be able to continue for a while as well. But I did want to um, pass sort of the virtual mic around. Uh, we have, uh, Kevin R. Frost, our director here with us. But before we go there, I you know, maybe open it up for um Tommy and Tweedy to say a few words. So Tommy, are you are you on? Yes, I am. Uh thank you, Lazana. And I agree, it was it was a great week. Um I'm so happy that we have the technology to be able to to get everyone together like this, to be able to continue sharing knowledge across Indian country. It's it's an inspiring week. And I know on uh, the staff side over here, we're all thankful to be able to be, you know, a small part of what the amazing work that you guys are all doing out in the Indian country. And so just thankful to be a part of this and that we we're able to keep doing it. Um, and again, thank you to all the presenters. Thank you, Tommy. Tweedy, you want to say a few words? I think I want to echo, you know, what you've said and Tommy said that I want to thank you everyone for being with us in this uh, virtual environment that uh, we're forced to be in. Um, it's a challenging time and um, I think it's very difficult for some people with health and finance worries. Um, I'm personally grateful for my health and being able to work from home and for our amazing DOE family, Kevin, Lozana, Tommy, 
uh, Jen Luna, Jamie Alley, Chris Venema, Jessica Beaker, Susan Manley, James Jensen. I appreciate you guys so much. Um, and I wish everyone health, perseverance, and maybe even a little bit of a joy in our remaining days of 2020 and for the new year 2021. Good things are coming. Thank you. Thank you, Tweety. And then uh, to close us out, um, I'm going to um, ask uh, Kevin, um, Director Kevin R. Frost to give us some, some closing words. Kevin, you're on if you want to unmute yourself. Thank you for that reminder, Lizana. Um, but, but definitely um, thanks again to everyone, uh, to our presenters out there. Um, also to our applicants, our, our tribes, um, these tribal communities that have stepped up to the plate to to begin expressing their self-determination and sovereignty by no longer depending on someone else to provide their electricity and power generation, but really to begin taking those next steps that at least we as an office see as, as kind of necessary um, in terms of the growth and evolution of these tribal communities. And understanding that within the Office of Indian Energy, we realize that energy is the nexus or the linchpin for a lot of things you want to do within your tribal lands or communities. Um, whether it's standing up housing for your own tribal members, um, whether it's looking at new enterprises that the tribe wants to stand up as well, and even just going so much as just looking after some of your basic resiliency issues that you might have and, and some autonomous operation in case of blackouts or brownouts. So your emergency um, services are have minimal impact as well. And then understanding this against a backdrop of the COVID-19 pandemic right now, um, this office, in some cases, might be even more critical um, to certain members of our constituency out there in Indian country. And understanding that, too, um, I, I definitely also would, would, would like to thank um, our contractor support staff uh, here in um, Golden, Colorado, as well as out in um, Washington, D.C. Uh, I know Tweety threw out some names um, for some team members. Um, Lizana had told you uh, some of our other team members as, as well. Um, and just kind of went through the the entire um, staff that we do have. At least at this point, um, we are still um, a rather small office, but the amount of work we do is four to five times that. And um, it's always great and inspiring to not only see what's being presented here at the program review and how tribes help out other tribes and that exchange of information, that invaluable exchange of information is what's necessary and needed right now in order to, to move Indian country forward. And while we have those tribes at the very front leading energy development, we also have to remember as an office, those tribes at the very back, those that have minimal capacity, that have minimal financial means, uh, that, that don't have any technical ability to stand up one of these projects. So whenever it comes to interacting with any members of our constituency like that, when we're able to move those tribes forward, then all of us move forward within Indian country. And that's one thing that, that this office does very, very well. And I haven't been to as many um, program reviews as everyone else on our team. Um, this is my fourth one. Um, I've actually been to one when I wasn't um, leading this office. But there have been some important changes that have been made within this office while I've been here, first as the deputy and now as the director. Um, things that I would, I would, I would like to know. Um, under this administration, we went from, uh, to an all of the above strategy, which now gives us the ability to not only remain fuel and technology neutral, but to interact with at least 574 federally recognized tribes, which means 574 different energy development goals. But also to, to look at the staffing that Lizana also brought up. Our office has grown and nearly doubled since last program review. And as well as, and, and equally important to that, as, as we look to, to become a more technically directed office, we've also implemented for the first time under this administration and, and under the senior leadership of DOE, a formalized cost share reduction process, which closed on December 10th um, of this month. And that's something that's gonna be very critical moving forward for the Office of Indian Energy. Um, and seeing what we can do as an office to assist tribes that aren't able to to have the financial uh, stability to go ahead and, and have their 50% cost share as, as well. 
but these are very important and vital things and these are things that can be done when you when there is support for this office of indian energy not only from senior doe leadership but the undersecretary of energy the deputy secretary and the secretary himself but also with um senate and uh house members up on the hill as well there's a lot of support for this office so if you want to see some of these great things that the office does and will continue to do by all means um talk about some of your successes as well when you talk to your delegation there's only so much that we can do because we have a small budget but as we staff up and as we see things happen for the future the future is very bright for the office of indian energy i'll look forward to the successes in the coming years from this organization and and lastly before i go i i, I would also like to take this time to recognize the incredible staff I work with on the federal side, on the contractor support side, um, with our national labs as well. It's an honor and a privilege to be in this position as a director of this office and, and to lead this office as it interacts with Indian country. But the most important takeaway that I can distinguish from being in my position and my time here within the Office of Indian Energy it's not leading the office or leading this great staff, this team. It's being one, a member of this team. And to me, that's been one of the most important and significant things that I've been able to achieve within my own professional um, career. So I am truly honored and thankful and blessed to be working with this tremendous team um, here at Indian Energy. And, as, and again, as I said, as, as we move forward, Please continue to call on us. Um, please continue to utilize our technical assistance. We are there as a solid, true partner. And you'll hear this phrase. You've heard it from me before, and you'll hear it into the future. We will not do the work for you. We will do the work with you. That will ensure capacity building, and that will ensure that your projects are successful in the future. So again, thank you, everyone, for attending this year's um, virtual, first inaugural virtual uh, program review and with that please stay safe out there um, watch after your elders your veterans your your tribal leaders your spiritual leaders as well and your entire tribal communities we all have to make make it through this um time period right now uh, together and in the words of my southern Ute people um i would like to say thank you to vuch de Royak, and on my navajo side i also say thank you okay it really has been an honor um working with everyone, and I look forward to your future successes. Everyone have a good day. And since I don't think anything can follow that, thank you, Kevin, so much uh, for your for your words. And um, I think that concludes the, the program review for this year. Thank you. Goodbye.